Hello, everyone, and welcome to phylloseminar.org. The current theme is on state-dependent uh, speciation and extinction models, and this is the first talk in a series of three talks on that topic. Please use the YouTube live comment box to ask questions. Today's speaker is Dr. Sarah P. Otto, or Sally. Dr. Otto is a professor in the Department of Zoology at the University of British Columbia. Using mathematical modeling and experimental evolution, Dr. Otto investigates the evolutionary forces generating biological diversity. With over 200 publications in a book, her awards include a MacArthur Fellowship, a Guggenheim Fellowship, the DC Prize, a Canada Research Chair, a Fellowship in the Royal Society of Canada, and the National Academy of Sciences. In addition to mathematical modeling, Otto's research group carries out phylogenetic analyses and experimental evolutionary studies using yeast, resulting in over 230 publications. Current research focuses on the nature and scope of beneficial mutations acquired in a changing environments to better understand the constraints on evolutionary adaptation in a changing world. For a phylogeneticist, her work on state-dependent speciation and extinction models has been foundational, so we're especially to have, happy to have her today. Welcome, Dr. Otto, and thank you for participating. Absolutely. Thank you for the invitation. And yeah, so this is going to be kind of a broad um, background talk on inferring the past for traits that alter speciation and extinction rates. And there are lots of collaborators on the various projects, but I really wanted to highlight Wayne Madison and Rich Fitzjohn, whose names will come up repeatedly. So comparative analyses, there's kind of two traditional types of questions that comparative analyses have attempted to address using present day or extant data, for example, shown here as uh, um, um, different trait states, purple and green, um, on a phylogeny of species, and these are the extant data time um, from a most recent common ancestor. So the two types of questions you might address with this type of data structure, uh, one would be, what impact does a trait have on speciation and extinction? What does purple or green, um, green do for speciation rates? And this has been this has been a long-standing question in evolutionary biology, asking addressing such topics as what is the influence of herbivory in insects, defense mechanisms in turn in plants, floral symmetry, um, and uh, biogeographic questions. How what how does tropic or temperate distribution influence speciation and extinction rate. So that's one kind of traditional question, what matters to the diversification uh, in different groups of organisms? And kind of a second stream of questions is, is related to trying to figure out what the past is for these characters. How in the past, what are the ancestral states for characters and how do we use this phylogenetic structure to map or, or trace ancestral states. For example, looking at uh, the past for shifts in migratory behavior or the shifts in biogeography. Or for example, asking questions like, did vivipary evolve multiple times? So the seeds of mangroves are viviparous, the seed um, immediately leads to um, growing shoots. Did that vivipary evolve once or multiple times? But what about if the trait that you're interested, actually you wanna map it back in time, but it also influences the rate of speciation and extinction. So what if these questions aren't separate for the trait you're interested in? Well, first of all, uh, if you're looking at a trait and you're trying to understand its history, diversification rates will vary over um, a phylogeny. So you'll have a different speciation rate and extinction rate in different parts of this tree, depending on the character. And so you can't, um, in order to kind of um, isolate the effect of a character, one approach is, okay, I'm gonna, um, use a sister species analysis, which focuses in on how diverse are lineages on one side of a ancestral node versus the other. So these two are relevant, there's one and one, but here this would be an example where the green um, trait is associated with a higher speciation rate. And if you had enough data like this, you might be able to say, oh, green is associated with more diversification. But that throws out a large fraction of the tree. It throws out many clades like this. Oftentimes it's a little bit harder to, to just label things as only green or only purple because there can be reversions inside these clades. And as pointed out by 
um, Kaffir and Musayan. I think Kaffir is going to be giving a, a seminar coming up. It's actually a little bit trickier because you have to also account for the times to shifting um, from an ancestral state to a derived state on one of these branches, but not the other. So that's one problem. The other um, issue is you can't tell whether or not sister um, clades are more diverse because of a higher speciation or a lower extinction rate or both. On the other hand, not only is it harder to um, investigate diversification rates because they depend on the traits and what their states are, but it's also harder to estimate um, the ancestral states. You can't go backward and necessarily be correct about your ancestral states when that state that you're that trait you're interested in can influence speciation and extinction. Let's do a, a sim simple thought experiment. So here is an example where there's a really short um, uh, branch separating these two um, extant species. They're both purple. So our natural inclination, most models would suggest that this ancestor is likely purple. But what if we have other information from the rest of the tree or elsewhere that the um, uh, purple state is actually really prone to extinction? That almost always in a very short period of time, the um, species in the purple state go extinct. Well, that shifts obviously what that ancestral state is likely to be. It's much more likely that it was green, did not go extinct and gave rise to the purple um, lineages that we see today. And this is just an example of, of how the ancestral state inference has to be, has to account for speciation and extinction. So uh, Wayne Madison um, and I got together over coffee <laughs> a long, long time ago, and we're struggling over how do you mathematically describe this problem if you wanted to um, tackle both changes in state and changes in speciation and extinction rate across the phylogeny. And, uh, you know, he knew, he knew that there would be an approach that we might be able to use that looked backwards over time, calculating the likelihood backwards in a tree. And I was familiar with birth death models going forward. It was kind of like a, a marriage of the two approaches to understand how to, how to describe this process. So sorry, I wanna- Sorry yeah. to interrupt. Um, so somebody's requested, and this, that's a great suggestion. Do you see that there's a little block that shows StreamYard is sharing your screen? Yeah, can I hide that? Hide. Yeah, thank you. Perfect. Uh, uh oh, great, perfect. Okay, thank you. Okay, it's going great so far. Okay, so let's let's walk um, everybody through the basic BISI approach. So we have a lineage, and it exists in one of these two character states, um, zero one. I'll call them. We'll see them as green or purple, and we're going to follow over a short interval of time what might happen. So in a very short interval of time, the, that particular lineage could go extinct. It could change state it could speciate or it could continue as is. And so we're gonna give um, parameters to the rate of all of those possible transitions, extinction rates, mu, changing states, rho, speciation rates, lambda, and they depend on the state um, that the um, species is in at that time, green or purple. And these are forward in time. For example, if species in state one are more prone to extinction, then the mu zero is gonna be um, um, less than mu one because the purple state has a higher extinction rate. Okay, so those are the parameters of the model. And what we realized is that we could describe differential equations for the likelihood as we traverse down the tree. And normally you'd say, okay, well, here are the equations just believe me, but I want, they're, they're, the logic of them is actually pretty interesting to understand. So I'm going to switch from this slide to uh, pen and paper and walk you through how we can describe the likelihood of seeing the, the tree that descends from a particular point in time and write equations for that likelihood as we descend through the tree. So let's see if this works. Over here. All right. Great. Okay, so just to recap, we're trying to under, we're somewhere on the tree and above this point in the tree. So this is the present day. Let's see, I gotta have it. 
really focus on it. There we go. So at some point T in the past, we are going to say at this point, we have a likelihood D of explaining everything that's descended from that point in time to the present. If the character is in one state, say zero at that point in time. So T is zero at the present, but going backwards, we're tracking time. And we want to um, then move back a little teeny little bit further back in time, T plus delta T. And we want to update that equation and get explain how it's going to account for everything that we see. So this, I'm using this triangle to represent the, uh, part of the phylogeny the shape of that phylogeny plus the extent tip states whatever whatever we've seen that's um in that triangle and so i'm trying to get all descent all patterns of descent and all trait states changes that happened from that point to the present okay so we can go a little bit further back in time and get an equation for the probability of explaining the extent data at that little um, uh, extra piece of time by walking through every possible thing that could happen in this interval of time. So what are those things that could happen? Well, first of all, nothing could happen. And the chance that nothing happens is one minus the chance that something happens. It could have changed state. It could have gone extinct. It could have speciated while it was in state zero. Um, but we only have a little bit of time for that to happen. So these are the rates. This is the amount of time that's passed. That's the chance that something has happened. And this is the chance that nothing has happened. So if nothing happens, so this is nothing, nothing changed, then um, the probability of explaining the data is still D0 at that time of, of explaining the data from this point, we already knew that. We already knew if it was at state zero, we could explain the data with probability to zero. But other things could have happened in that little interval of time. We could have had um, a transition rate in that little period of time. And if we did have a transition, now it's um, no longer in state zero, it's now in state one. So we explain the data from the present, from that point on to the present with probability D1 um, because of the change in state. Or it could have speciated in that little bit of time that happens with um, the rate parameter lambda that's describing the species. Oh, I should just write this down underneath. This is transition. The alternative now that I'm looking at is speciation. So we have a speciation rate when it was in state zero. In a little bit of time that is passed, but now, now no, we're on a branch. We're actually not in a node. So we don't, there's nothing, there's nothing that we see to the present on the other side of this little branch. And that means somewhere between that point in the present, that baby lineage, what and whatever descendants it had, had to go extinct. So I need to describe that extinction, and I'm going to describe it with probability E0. That's the probability that a baby lineage born at time T goes extinct by the present. But then we also have this lineage that um, did survive to the present and does explain the what we did see on the left. But actually, I don't care which one went extinct and which one survived to the present. I don't care if it's the left one that went extinct or the right one that went extinct. So I have to double that because I don't care which one went extinct. There's two ways for one lineage to go extinct and the other to explain the data. And that leaves us with more, one more possible thing. The other possible event that could have happened in this teeny little interval of time is that it could have gone extinct. It could have gone extinct with probability mu zero times the um, amount of time that's passed. But then we have a problem. If the lineage we're tracing actually went extinct, if this goes extinct right there, we can't possibly explain the data. And so this um, then cannot explain the data that descends, and it has a chance zero of explaining it. Okay, so that's the, that is essentially the basic math of BISI. It is explaining how we go back down a lineage to account for changes in the probability of accounting for what we see in the present. 
um, rather than always dealing with these teeny little intervals of time, we let those little intervals of time go to zero and calculate the change per, per unit time. And by definition, that is the derivative of d0 dt. So we get a derivative from taking this equation, subtracting off what it was in the previous state, um, and dividing by the, the amount of time that passed. So this is the rise over the run, and that gives us this derivative. But there's a little bit of a sleight of hand I did, and that was because I introduced this thing, and I haven't actually really defined it or derived it. But you can kind of think of the logic in a similar way. So what is E0 of t? That's the probability of a lineage and all of its descendants, all descendants going extinct by the present. By now, if it starts in state zero. And having calculated the probability of seeing the lineage that we did see, why don't we just quickly derive the probability of seeing this um, extinction event that we have. So let me do that quickly. So again, we just do the same thing. If, if it's E0 at time t, what is the um, chance of seeing the ex um, extinction if we go back a teeny little bit of extra time into the past? Well, again, nothing might have happened. But then we still have to explain the extinction of that lineage. Or there could have been a transition rate. And then we have to explain the extinction of the lineage, but it's now in state one, not in state zero. Or it could have speciated. And now we've got to kind of double the problem. Now we have two lineages, but they both have to go extinct by the present. And assuming independence of those lineages, then we just square the first, the left one has to go extinct times the probability that the right one goes extinct. So they both have to go extinct. And, and then finally, that it could have gone extinct in this teeny little window of time that we're looking at. But then that's great because with probability one, it'll go extinct by the present if the lineage actually goes extinct right now when we're looking at it in this little interval of time. And that's it. That gives us a kind of, again, we can see, get a differential equation for how these change over time uh, by taking the difference, the, the difference in those extinction rates from one bit of time minus the previous bit of time taking the rise over the run, dividing it by that little interval of time, and we get the equations that I had on the um, slides. One more thing. So now we have differential equations. I was worried, I was like, oh, there's no way, we can't, I can't solve these. These equations can't be solved, but computers can solve them. So um, Wayne's like, well, I think we can move, you know, just code this in Mesquite at the time. And, um, but we need starting conditions. So one last thing before I turn over from pen and paper back to slides is to think about those starting conditions. So now I wanna go back up and let's go to the tip of the tree of this. Um, let's consider a tip state and it's in state zero. So right here, I need an initial condition. What's the initial condition at that point in time? Well. Um, the probability of, of observing all of the descendant data that I see if, if at time zero I'm in state zero is one because it's already, it's in state one, so I'm good. I cannot explain this tip state of being in zero if I were in state one. So this is zero. I can't explain it if I'm in the wrong state. How about the extinction initial conditions? Well, if it were extinct, then I can't explain the data whether it was in state one or in state zero. So this gives us starting con initial conditions and now we have differential equations. And um, from there, we can proceed to calculate the likelihood across the tree. So I've described going down a branch, 
at a node, you have the speciation rate. That'll happen with probability lambda zero times a little interval of time. Um, and then we can traverse down those nodes down to the root of the tree. That, oh, actually, that's probably worth a, a short aside. What do we do with the root? So at the root of the tree, and um, what we recommend doing now is once you get down to the very, very root of the tree, you have a D zero of explaining the descendant tree, whatever it looked like. Um, if it were in state zero, or if it was in state one. Now, initially when we wrote uh, the first busy paper, we recommended taking the equilibrium state probability of seeing state zero and state one given the parameters of the model. We don't anywhere any longer recommend taking that equilibrium for the root state, and that's because the equilibrium is where the system's going to. But the ancestor state is where it's coming from. And in particular, if there's kind of unidirectional changes, you'll never get the right root state because there, because it's, it has to come from the other, the other state, the other the state from which you move. So instead, we recommend that you use kind of an um, un, um, uninformed prior and say that the probability that it is in state zero at the root is simply the probability of explaining the data um, in state zero divided by the total probability of explaining the data over all states. And then this gives you the probability of um, being in state zero at the root. And you um, use that to get your overall probability of explaining the data at the root as P0, D0 plus one minus P0. And this has better properties in cases like where only transitions happen in state from state zero to state one. This will um, allow the root to be always in state zero if you see a smattering of state zero and state one. Okay, that's an aside. Right. And that was so that was really helpful and <laughs> and a great explanation. I uh, do we need to do anything special at the nodes? I mean, so we've been talking about the edges. Yeah, so maybe I should just go just briefly through the node because I kind of did that quickly. So now let's say that we're at a node. We've just traversed down a branch and let's call this N and this M. So this is some clade N with a whole bunch of structure and tip states in it and another clade M. And we're right in this little period of time, delta T. So the at that speciation event, the probability of explaining um, that speciation event is there can be a speciation in that little piece of time, which is consistent with the observation. And no, no other change, like an extinction or a transition, can explain that particular observation. But now, in order to explain the data that descends from it, we have to, on the left, explain it. It starts in state zero, and it will explain the descendant data n, and then times starting in state zero and explaining the descendant data m. So, so far, I haven't really paid attention to what it has to explain. But at this point, it has to explain the data on the left and here it has to explain the data on the right. And so that's now being explicitly stated what the descendant data actually um, refers to. Great. So, so it, you're, yeah. you're, doing, you're going up a branch, you're integrating your differential equation, you hit one of these nodes, and then you use this equation. And then you that's right. The yeah. Equation. And then you just go all through all of the nodes until you get to the bottom. And then that will give you a likelihood at the very, very bottom. Um, all right. Over here. So that's cool because once you have a likelihood, um, this has allowed us to go over all possible transitions, all possible um, off branch events that could have happened, it could have given rise to new species that went extinct by the present and they're included, not just what we saw on the tree. And uh, it gives the likelihood of both seeing the phylogeny and the extent um, trait states. 
we can then use likelihood ratio tests, which is nice. We can test whether or not the speciation rate or the extension rates are equal, for example. We can get credibility intervals. We can use Bayesian framework to provide posterior probability distribution. So that's what BISI allowed us to, um, to, to do that we couldn't do before by having this calculation. So what do you do when you have a new uh, method? You first test and make sure it works. We um, did that along with Peter Midford in that um, 2007 paper. And this is just an example where we have parameters and we're, uh, this is 500 clades of each of which is 500 um, taxa um, big with specific speciation and extinction rates. There's actually two examples here, the hollow ones and the solid ones. And you can see in any one clade, you might not be exactly right. The crossbars are the exact right parameter, but you're close. And on average, you hit the right speciation um, rate um, for both the purple and the green taxon, both when the, their equal speciation rates or when they're different. Same for the transition rates, basically the same message. Um, each, each clade might not be big enough to get a really solid answer, but on average, you get the right answer. Extinction rates tend to be much more um, noisy um, in their estimation, so you can see a much wider scatter. The point estimates are correct on average, but um, with substantial scatter. And you might even wonder where the heck is the information even coming from for an extinction rate, because those extinctions happen off of the tree that we saw. Um, but if you are familiar with lineage over time plots, there's those lineage over time plots do this thing where you, your, extinct, your diversification rate in the past is basically speciation minus extinction rate. But your diversification rate near the present is closer to just the speciation rate. There hasn't been time for extinction yet. And your different traits are gonna have different kind of um, uh, lineage over time plots near the present. They're gonna have a different uptick near the present. And that's where the signal about extinction happens. It's really about the length of those tip states. So there's a little bit of information, not a lot. And, and, and that's why there's a lot more scatter there. There's fewer uh, um, events and there's an absence of evidence. So it's using only those um, lineage over it's only the uptick near the present um, that provides us with any information. So this is great. We can disentangle speciation and extinction potentially, analyze trade evolution and diversification jointly rather than separately. It was available first in Mesquite and then Rich developed, uh, Rich Fitzjohn, who was really a, a spectacular software designer and biologist designed it, um, developed diversity for R. But if initially it required full phylogenetic information. And that's where Rich um, first came in. He um, developed methods that didn't require full phylogenetic information because very, very few um, clades or phylogenetic trees are complete. So we res um, accounted for unresolved clades in two ways. Um, one was it, we had these unresolved clades where we knew how many species were in this and how many were in each state, but we didn't know the phylogeny in that, that state. That's um, actually, I'm referring to that as method two, unresolved clades. We do that using a forward time birth death model, or even simpler, if, um, we can account for the um, probability of sampling um, species in state zero or state one, um, if that's known. Like if we know we have a, a 1,000 species in the clade, but we've only sampled 100 in our uh, tree, then we have a F of one tenth. Um, and we might even know something about whether we've over or under sampled species that are green versus purple, allowing us to estimate these. And this is the easiest method because all we have to do is refine the, you remember when I was saying you have initial conditions for those differential equations? This is the method one is easy because the chance of observing a, a species in your clade in state zero is just F zero, the chance that you sampled it. Um, and so all we have to do is change the initial conditions.
Anyway, that's what Rich did. And kind of interestingly, you don't lose a lot of power um, to detect diversification rates by if you use either of these methods um, uh, and don't have a complete tree. And that's shown here. So this is the proportion of tips that are actually present in the phylogeny. So there's a 500 species clade, and this has all 500 in um, the analysis, but this would only have um, a tenth of those, but 50, 50 species, 100 species, et cetera, in that clade that we examine. And so what am I showing here? I'm showing the relative diversification rate um, for trait zero minus trait one. That's the speciation minus the extinction rate is the diversification rate. And we're looking at that for species in state zero minus that for species in state one. And for if that's what you're interested in, it's interesting because you get a really good estimator of that if, um, even if you have a sparser and sparser and sparser tree. If you wanted to estimate extinction rates, that goes out the window as you sample less and less because you have really little information about those tips, the shape of the tree near the present. May I ask, so is this when you're estimating the sampling rates or is this if you have them? Oh, sorry, I didn't, I didn't say that. Um, the method one where the F the F method is dash curves, and there's less information that you're providing it um, than if you have kind of very clear information about which clades are missing taxa. So that's the solid curves. And the right answer is um, uh, the dashed line. Great. Sym symmetric is when the two um, traits have an equal influence on, um, species, on diversification, and this one is when um, trait zero increases diversification. So, so the, not, the phylogeny need not be complete, especially if what we're interested in is estimating the net rate of diversification, speciation minus extinction. Since that time, there's been kind of a burst of different methods that accounted for quantitative traits that looked at cladogenesis. So when I derived, when we looked at what happened at the speciation rate, I said it was only um, speciation that was allowed. But these cladogenetic methods also allow some probability that during speciation, the trait state will change. That's very common if you're looking at species ranges, for example, or poly polyploidization, where the speciation may actually involve a shift in the trait you're looking at. MUSI um, uh, looks at multiple states or multiple traits. GOC, um, a, more of a, uh, multiple places in space. And then um, the HISI models that allow, that were kind of a generalization of this multi-state um, case where um, but really focusing on the possibility that you might not know what the trait is that is driving speciation and extinction. We'll return to HISI in a minute. Anyway, a plethora of different SSE methods. They've been, uh, here's an example um, from our recent review about their application in angiosperms. So there's been 152 studies applying 629 SSE models to uh, a wide variety of different traits. Geographic range was the most commonly studied, but flowering, flowering morphology, breeding system, and pollination um, were a close second, um, that suite of traits. We've used it, for example, to ask, is evo um, asexual reproduction an evolutionary dead end in Neonothera? Or does color, um, brightly colored um, flowers do they promote speciation in Ipomoea and morning glories? In this recent review, this uh, we looked at which studies found a or which um, applications found a significant result in a, a different state dependent diversification, which ones failed to find any difference in the state in the uh, um, diversification rate. And you can see the like the biggest predictor of getting a significant result is the number of tips in your tree, um, or having an older tree where there's more time for those that those um, uh, parameters to have an effect. This one kind of is 
um, a little funny. If you have a, you're more likely to see a significant result if you have a lower sampling fraction, which doesn't make sense because poor sampling that can't possibly help you. But the reason is that the that let, when we have really large clades, they tend to be um, uh, uh, have a small sampling fraction. So the, this bump here is mainly those large clades. You would never have a clade of size twenty and only have 10% sampling from it. So you, so you just don't have those. And um, BISI was also, is, was then later uh, applied. So we've been talking about this as a speciation and extinction model, but it's um, a general example of a birth death model. And so you can apply it within species too, where speciation now is births, um, extinction is deaths. And Stadler and Bonhoeffer did this for um, applications to HIV and other disease models. They had to adapt the method though, because they're not always looking at just extant data. Individual viruses might have been sampled at different points in time. So they had to account for when those samples were taken. And in that case, birth corresponded with the case of HIV, birth corresponds to infection. You had one infection before, now you have two. An extinction or death corresponds to if that individual is treated and so no longer infectious or if they die. Uh, just briefly, um, it's also one major limitation of the BISI like methods is as we go down through the tree, we're ignoring anything else on anywhere else in the tree. And that's kind of fundamental to how the method works. Um, one thing we explored though was an alternative where maybe there's density dependence keeping the total number of species or the total population size constant. Does that completely mess up the inference? So we're applying BISI, which doesn't assume a constant population size, but we're actually simulating um, cases where there is a constant population size. And I did this with Carl Rothfels. And there it, um, we found that if there's no difference in diversification rate, BISI picks it up. And when there was a true difference, BISI also on average gets the right answer and it was significant and a reasonably high chance. So that's something I think that could use more exploration. Um, and that's BISI's wrong, the model is wrong. There's a constant population size, but yet um, it may be robust enough to that particular change in the underlying model. But it's not always robust. Um, importantly, correlation does not imply causation and it doesn't matter how fancy your phylogenetic method is. You're really ultimately, BISI is ultimately, um, um, estimating a correlation. A correlation between this trait that you happen to be looking at and the extent character states and the shape of the tree, where, where um, bursts of speciation happen, where there's few speciation. And as Darwin pointed out in 1872, even when we may often falsely attribute to correlated variation structures which are common to whole groups of species and which in truth are simply due to inheritance. Wayne and Rich wrote a paper highlighting just how important this problem is. And, and they um, were looking um, first when you're just correlating two traits, so not BISI application, but just correlations in state. So this might be milk production and fur production, and we might be looking um, at vertebrate evolution. And yes, they are very correlated, so we might make, think that milk causes you to make fur or something like that, but they're only correlated because they happen to both be transitions that occurred um, on one particular branch. So there's really only one piece of evidence, the trait change there and the trait change there. And we're looking at those traits that happen to change on that branch. And there's kind of a problem with likelihood. Likelihood isn't a counting mechanism. It doesn't say how many pieces of evidence go into this. It just says, is it much more likely to explain the data if they're correlated or not, or if they differ in speciation rate or not. But we don't know from a significant um, difference in likelihood whether or not there was one piece of evidence or hundreds of pieces of evidence underlying 
that significant result. So back to the busy example, for example, a highly significant association may be driven by factors that we're not considering. So for example, it might be this green trait, whatever that is, that really drives speciation in this clade. But I'm not looking at that green trait. I'm looking at this red blue trait. And it just so happens that it evolved so that red is more um, correlated with these green traits by chance, by luck. And so I can be misled and infer that red truly drives a higher speciation rate when it doesn't. It's the green trait that does. And this is a uh, general problem. It, BISI can have a very high false positive rate when other factors underlie the diver diversification differences. And it's basically a model inadequacy problem. When we only allow one trait to be present to account for heterogeneity in speciation and extinction rates across the tree, then uh, BISI may well give a significant result when there's really something else going on that we haven't included in our model. So this is a big caveat. Be, what to do about it. A, a number of things. I think we as a field have to be cautious of trees with few transitions. So take a look at your tree and make sure that you think that there appears to be multiple pieces of evidence across it. Consider alternative traits and use MUSI for that. Simulate neutral traits to just see how likely your parameter estimates are to generate um, uh, the tree. Um, or add hidden states to the model um, to absorb the background effects. So even if you don't have this green trait measured, if you say there's there might be another trait that I haven't measured and it's hidden, I don't know what the current states are, but I, I know that there's a possibility that there is another state. That's what Hissy does. And it allows, basically soaks up um, kind of cases like this where it's really easy to explain the data with a, with a hidden state, um, a green state that you don't know about. So those are all positive um, things we can do. There's also new machine learning methods. Um, there's a paper by Lambert et al. coming out in um, systematic biology right now. And it used machine learning to basically recreate what BISI does. And it found the same accuracy, the same ability to detect um, speciation and extinction rate differences as BISI does, as the likelihood model does, when the model is correct. And so that's a great first step. But what, where that's really going to be valuable is you can train it not just on the model, this model, but you can uh, explore a variety of models and um, uh, and, it, and use machine learning to infer um, not just what the speciation and extinction rates differences are, but what is the chance that we're misled because the model's wrong. So it could potentially allow learning when the model's correct as well as when what the differences in diversification rate are. So I'm looking forward to that. The other, the, the kind of more brain dead approach that I, I've liked to take is, is the following. If there's a false correlation due to something else going on, it should vary in direction, sometimes giving evidence for red being more speciose and sometimes for um, blue being driving up diversification rates. And so if we look at clade after clade after clade after clade, it shouldn't be repeatable. So that's what. Uh, um, I recommend is replicating the analysis across clades as much as you can. For some questions, you can't because it's only evolved once or only evolved in one clade. But for some characters, it's evolved repeatedly and you can replicate the analyses and then um, assess how robust the answer is across independent clades. So we've done this um, in polyploid. I'll give you a couple examples where we did this kind of replication of BISI and asked, does polyploidy increase the long-term success of a lineage? We're polyploid. Um, all of these organisms are anciently polyploid. So it, it's so common, you'd think that maybe it, that's it's common because it drives higher diversification rates. So Itai Mayros and um, colleagues and I gathered data and chromosome numbers, inferred transitions in ploidy level across 63 genera of plants, 
And so this is a histogram of results. So <laughs> I gotta walk you through this. This, for those 63 clades, we asked, what is the probability that the, um, there was higher diploid diversification than polyploid diversification? And you can see that um, of those 63 clades, almost all of them are stacked up here where there's a higher diploid diversification rate. So that's a sig very significantly non-uniform result. We have almost no clades where the, there's evidence for higher di polyploid diversification. So diploids exhibit higher diversification in clade after clade after clade. And that's due to a combination of a higher speciation rate and a lower extinction rate, um, according to these estimates. Uh, similarly, we looked across, um, we looked at plant sexual systems um, to see whether or not diece was significantly associated, having separate sexes was significantly associated with diversification rates in plants. And this was with the Tree of Sex Consortium. Uh, so the, specifically, we asked, do species with separate sexes, diece, diversify at higher or lower rates in species where the sexes are found on the same plant. And there we're I'm going to lump together hermaphrodites, monoecious plants, gynodioecious plants, etc., where the sexes are found together. And so when the this is what we saw in this case. And now that now it's much closer to a uniform distribution. Um, there's a slight tendency, but it wasn't significant. Um, so this there for higher diversification when the sexes were separate but this was not significant. There was no consistent effect of diese on diversification rates across these 35 genera. So I think that gives you a, a kind of snapshot of where we came from and where we, uh, we are now. I think that there's, um, we the sophistication of our understanding of the problems of BISI and other likelihood methods um, uh, has really ramped up. Um, so I think that helps us um, approach these questions with uh, maybe both a higher level of skepticism, but also using that information to, to gather what we can from the shape of phylogenies and what we know about extant characters. So interpret with caution and repeat when possible. Um, and with that, I will really thank a number of different collaborators. Um, the recent work, the Helmstetter et al. review was um, a diverse team funded by CSAB in France, headed um, by Sylvain Glemont and Jos Kaffer. Uh, and again, I want to highlight um, this, the, the importance of going out to coffee with great colleagues like Wayne Madison and discussing problems from different points of view, because that's what allowed us to write BC down. And I want to also highlight the creativity and software development skills of Rich, which made this really usable and possible. And if you want to be convinced of just how creative a person Rich is, check out this video, this puppet video. All right, I'll end there. And <laughs> <laughs> that was fantastic. Thank you so, so much. You're welcome. Uh, so I encourage everybody to ask questions. Um, I've got a couple. So do you mind just saying a little bit more about the, the population size constraint misspecification? And you, you mentioned work with Rothfels, and is this published? Yeah. No, it's not published. And we kind of, it took a uh, backseat. We haven't returned to it. Um, so if anybody wants to um, pour more energy into it, I'd love to address this question. But basically, in, uh, with a constant population size or a constant number of species, traits will, can still increase um, diversification or increase um, uh, fitness. And that difference in fitness can be, is what, exactly what BISI tries to detect, but it is assuming a growing clade uh, rather than a constant size clade. And so the work the simulations that um, Carl and I did, and this was just preliminary, suggested that actually BISI does, gets the answer pretty much um, right on. It recognizes that the whole clade on average isn't growing, 
but the uh, new trait is increasing. That's the diversification rate. Yeah, we were actually uh, had exact. I mean, we we had exactly this question, and we were <laughs> with with a a, 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 a Mussy type model. Um, but yeah, we can chat about. I mean, I, I that's be great. It's yeah. something we're interested in for sure. Uh, okay, so Rosanna has uh, a question, um, two questions. In the density dependent diversification, do you make speciation and extinction a function of population size or just one of those rates? So in, in that case, um, we no, we were using a simple model, which was just a constant population size or constant number of species. And it, then it was um, one character uh, increase the chance of speciation or extinction relative to the other one. Okay, and she has- And, and, and um, come and watch Rosanna's talk, I think, at the next Phyla seminar. She's done some, um, uh, really pushed a lot of these methods forward recently. Cool. Okay, and second question, knowing what we know now, that you are more likely to find differences in diversification with older or more sample trees. How do you s approach selecting multiple clades? Right, right. Um, yeah, so I think it is a balance. Um, you know, you, you might think that it's better to do all angiosperms at once in one mega phylogeny because that has the most um, taxa and that would have the most power, but then you don't get a sense of how repeatable your answer is. So I think it is, it is this kind of um, sweet spot between having clades that are large enough that you have power within them, but, but not so large that you can't repeat, repeat your analyses. But, but we are um, definitely building up uh, more and more robust phylogenies. And so that will, I think we'll just continue to see more and more attempts to to use those phylogenies to say, well, what's driving the shape of this phylogeny? What's driving diversification across it? Great questions. And I also wanted to thank Rosanna Zinal Ferguson for helping co-organize this. Um, so here's another thing that we encountered playing with these flavors of models is how do you, that's, I think it's great just to have a discussion. How do you simulate? Um, so that sounds like sort of an mm. obvious thing. We simulate, you can simulate this thing forward in time, but the question is, what is what do we condition on? So yeah. for instance, do we, like if you're simulating, do you condition on non-extinction? You condition on getting the same number of tips as you got in your real data, or how does that all work? It, it gets right. to be some pretty tricky conditional probabilities, it seems to me. It, it absolutely does. And I think, um, yeah, I, I, absolutely. And and hopefully if your, lar your phylogeny is large enough and your signal large enough, then that last little bit of, of evidence um, that you include or not include, depending on where you cut off your simulations will have negligible effect. But um, it need not if, especially if your clades are small. Um, the other conditioning that we, so here's a puzzle that I've been working on and need to wrap up. Let, we never condition on the size of the clades we use, but we would never do these kind of analyses on a small clade. So forget busy, just try and estimate speciation and extinction rates from a tree using Sean Nee's method, likelihood method. Well, you would never do that on a, on a clade with only two or only three or only five. You'd probably not even do it with a clade that's only size 10. And so, so what I thought was like, okay, let's condition on that. Let's condition on, I'm gonna be honest, I'm never gonna do this kind of analysis if there's fewer than 10 species. So let's condition on that. But then what it turns out is by conditioning on that, you're allowing, now you can explain 11 or 10 the the ones near that boundary with really really high extinction rates but you've conditioned on keeping the clade no matter how uh, uh, unlikely it is to see a clade like that no matter how high the extinction rate is so you actually get less precise estimates by accounting for that conditioning <laughs> than you would not ignoring the conditioning that you're doing when you only work on um, big clades that is, I just want to park that as actually these conditioning issues are problematic and how we account for them. That's really crazy. Funny. Yeah. 
I'll be honest and say I didn't quite understand what I mean. I understand the correlation does not apply causation. You were yeah. saying that likelihood methods don't account, account for pieces of evidence, and I thought maybe you could just say a little bit. Yeah, the number of pieces of evidence. So if you have, like, imagine in your brain a, a, a phylogeny where there's just one time, one key adaptation that led to really, really high speciation events, but it only there's only one transition in your tree. But the um, the d branches are now really, really short in that clade, and it's really unlikely to explain that from a neutral model. So, you, so your trait is going to if you're looking at a trait, purple or green is going to be associated with that um, uh, burst of speciation. And so uh, you, your likelihood of explaining it with a busy model is much, much higher than if you forced, if you did not account for those, did not have a trait in your model. But there's only one place in the tree where it evolved. And there's no counting, just likelihood is just calculating what's the probability of seeing this data it doesn't say oh and here something happened it, it, the d degrees of freedom don't come in it doesn't count it happened here and happened here and happened here so there's no degrees of freedom um, in that likelihood calculation oh. yeah um i don't know do you have any i mean you you wrote this one paper that set off uh this incredible sweet like a whole sort of subfield of I don't, research. Do you have any reflections? <laughs> <laughs> we, yeah, we wrote it, but I will not take that. Yeah. Yeah, you the plural. It's a joint effort. We, and, um, yeah, you know, it, it's, it, it is exciting to have um, help people, to, um, like myself, you know, I'm really curious, how does, what is the consequence of, to taxa that are sexual or asexual that have separate sexes to have, so to have a tool that allows us to kind of um, eke out of the shape of a phylogeny, as much information as we can get. Phylogenies are expensive, you know, for us to build. We want to get as much information out as we can, but we also have to be humble in that that answers are not always as clear cut and we have to be, it's one piece of evidence. The shape of the phylogeny provides one piece of evidence and we need multiple pieces of evidence, either from multiple clades or um, uh, uh, you know, the type of work that Boris Ajik and others are doing, looking at actual molecular changes and seeing if they can cor corroborate the phylogenetic inferences. Cool. All right, I think we got one more question from Fabricio Villalobos. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Thinking on what trait causes species selection, how can we compare their effect? Is it possible to apply different methods, e busy versus quasi, and compare parameters? Yeah, you, you can. And then I, I think also there's other methods that are like MISI, which is, you know, attempting to just um, uh, estimate what is the evidence for differences in speciation and extinction? And then you can look at which trait better matches where in the tree those shifts in diversification have happened. But yeah, you can, you can um, add in more than one trait. Rosanna, for example, did that with polyploidy and self-compatibility, self-incompatibility in the Solanaceae. So rather than just having kind of one character she allowed for two characters and she also found that polyploidy in that in solanaceae didn't had a lower diversification rate but it was actually even that wasn't as important as being able to um being self-incompatible and being outcrossing that was the major determinant of uh, diversification in her analysis so yes it's a great idea if you think if you think you, there are two characters could be really influencing a trait, include them both. Great. Well, that's a great way to end to advertise for the next talk. So that's yeah. October twentieth <laughs> um, at nine a.m. Pacific time. And um, yeah, I I, I mistweeted before, but that's or I had it uh, on the website wrong before, but it, the correct date is October twentieth. So thank all you, right. Eric. For Thank you again. Really wonderful. Absolutely. All right. Bye now. <laughs>